Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this, uh, this CBRL um, skills session on how to get published in a Middle Eastern journal. Um, my role today is to do uh, the introductions and uh, some of the housekeeping. Um, we're, we're thrilled that today we have joining um, with us representatives from um, Ijmez, the journal the, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, um, Dr. Joel Gordon, um, the Associate Editor of the British Association of Middle Eastern Studies Journal, Dr. Noha Mello, and also uh, Professor Selim Tamari from the Jerusalem Quarterly. And today's session is being chaired by um, Dr. Sarah Irving, who is the editor of CBRL's journal, Contemporary Levant. So first of all, um, I know I can see a lot of familiar names here as well, but a lot of new names, which is great. For those of you who are maybe not familiar with CBRL, we're the Council for British Research in the Levant, and we're a UK charity um, that promotes and supports um, research um, on the Levant. Um, we have two institutes in the region. We have um, the Amman Institute uh, that I'm director of, and also we have in East Jerusalem, the Kenyan Institute as well. We're based at the British Academy in, in London, and we are one of the British International Research Institutes, or BIRI. So some of you may be familiar with the British Institute at Ankara, and the British School at Rome and the British School in Athens. We're in total uh, about uh, with seven and eight, if you include the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. Please do um, look at our website. Um, and we'll also put in the chat a link um, to the to the Biris um, in the on, on the British Academy's website as well. So I think with no more ado, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Sarah to, uh, to, to, um, to start as, as the chair of our session today. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Carol. Uh, yes, my name's Sarah Irving. I'm a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at Edge Hill University in Lancashire. Um, and I'm also editor of the CBRL journal Contemporary Levant. Um, and I will be chairing this evening. Um, hopefully reasonably light touch, as long as nothing goes too wrong. Um, we have three speakers today. Each of them will talk for between five and 10 minutes to introduce their journals and the main things that they look for in an article submission. Um, do's, don'ts, tips, recommendations, um, the kind of things that if you are uh, a PhD uh, candidate or an early career scholar, you may have in the back of your head um, as wanting to know before you make your first article submissions. Or if, for instance, you are from a non-Anglophone academic culture and you are considering um, trying out publishing in an English language journal for the first time. Um, we'd also particularly like um, uh, to consider a little bit in this environment how journals can also to some extent um, decolonize in terms of being um, as open as possible to a wide range of scholars, scholars from different parts of the world um, and across a wide range of institutions and types of institution. So uh, okay, so we are going to start off uh, hearing from Noha Mello, who is a professor at the University of Bedfordshire and an adjunct professor at Stockholm University. She's the author of several books about Arab media, including The Making of Arab News, Modern Arab Journalism, Arab Media, Reporting the MENA Region, 
and Voice of the Muslim Brotherhood. She re has recently co-edited the first comprehensive handbook on Arab media. And as per today, she is associate editor of the British Journal of Middle East Studies and a member of the editorial boards of Arab Media and Society, International Journal of Press Politics, Journal of Arab and Muslim Media Research, and Journalism Studies. Despite all of those commitments, she's also managing to join us today, um, for which we are very thankful. Um, Noha, please take it away. Thank you very much, Sarah and Carol. Okay, um, hi everybody. Uh, I would like to share some slides, just a few, um, if you don't mind. <laughs> so as Sarah said, I'm Associate Editor uh, of the British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, and I've been so since 2016. So let me first tell you a, a little bit about the journal. Uh, it is a refereed academic journal published for the British Society for Middle Eastern Studies, known as Prismas. Uh, it was founded in the journal uh, in 1974, um, and it used to be called Prismas Bulletin. It changed uh, the title in 1991 to British Journal of Middle Eastern Studies. Um, and uh, we used to be published in four issues per year until 2018, when this changed to five issues per year, reflecting the growing demand and the increasing number of articles we receive. We usually publish like maybe one issue, a special issue per year, sometimes every second year, depending on the backlog of articles we have. In terms of scope, we have a balance in the coverage between social sciences and kind of more traditional disciplines associated with Middle Eastern and Islamic studies. So we have uh, contributions covering all aspects of the Middle East, language, literature, history, political economy, anthropology, sociology, geography, culture, and religion. But generally, the, the focus is on humanities and social sciences, not business, management, or medicine. And we cover the whole region, the Arab region, Iran, Kurdish areas, Turkey, and Israel. Um, I know the title says British, but it doesn't necessarily mean that our audience is only British. Uh, our data shows that the journal has an international audience coming from uh, Europe, US, and certainly the Middle East as well. Uh, this is our team. Our editor is Dr. Lloyd Regent from Glasgow University, and we are six associate editors working with him. We also have a book review section, and its editor is Dr. Alam Saleh. Uh, and the review sections cover uh, covers the publications on all subjects uh, connected with the Middle East. So let me tell you a little bit about our review process. Um, well, first, the editor delegates to associate editors uh, a few manuscripts each. We read the articles first to make kind of a preliminary decision. This is basically the first stage, and it includes checking that no author identification is shown on the manuscript. I know it sounds kind of common sense, but some authors leave their names on page one. So of course, if this happens, we have to return the manuscript to the author and ask them to resubmit. Uh, following that, and unless the article has obvious weaknesses in terms of presentation, for example, we send it to two to three reviewers and the outcome could be revision, reject, or accept as is. Uh, we choose reviewers based on the keywords and the subject matter covered in the article. Um, I could actually send uh, the manuscript to or, or invite up to 10 reviewers just to get the three that I, that I need. Uh, so it depends really on the availability of reviewers. And I have to say the most important challenge is the review process. This is the core operation. Uh, we depend on the reviewers to deliver meaningful and constructive reviews. But it can happen that reviewer, a reviewer only writes like two sentences, which are not much to share with the author. Um, this means that we have then to go and find uh, a third or fourth reviewers, which might delay the review process. Um, of course, we have to accept the reviewers' judgment as their best professional judgment. Uh, and so we accept uh, their recommendations unless, uh, as I said, it's, it's not substantial, like two sentences, which are not enough. 
um, and if one reviewer, let's say, says accept, the other says reject, then we have to find other reviewers uh, in order to have, um, you know, good feedback to, to um, uh, send to the author. Um, some may ask, can they revise and resubmit more than once? Yes, a few articles were revised maybe two or three times. So let me talk you through some kind of concrete tips. First, you have to ask yourself, especially if you are an early career researcher, what is the goal of submitting, let's say, to our journal? Um, I mean, are you doing this to contribute to your tenure, obviously, or REF submission? Now, if you are familiar with the UK uh, system, you know REF stands for Research Excellence Framework. You might have a different framework uh, where you are, but it is a kind of research audit that takes place every five or six years. So you really have to know why you're doing this, uh, how this is helping you. Um, for instance, if you work in a political science department, is that really the right journal for you? Um, and think of the audience who is reading the journal. So I usually don't advise people to look at the impact factor so much. Maybe my colleagues will disagree, uh, but I really think it's good to know who is reading um, the journal. So check the contributions or the abstracts on our website, let's say for the last five, uh, three to five years, uh, to see the focus and the interdisciplinarity and the quality of studies published. And obviously don't try to submit the same manuscript to two journals at the same time, because we invest a lot of time and effort in the review process. Now, if you are a PhD student, uh, I believe you might have very good empirical data uh, although I, of course, you can submit a, a journal, uh, an article to us, but I actually usually advise PhD students to think of converting their whole dissertation into a monograph, because this is really very helpful for you. Uh, but if you also have uh, the chance to write an article based on your uh, data or field work, um, I believe you have a very good um, a chance and an advantage here because you usually PhD students usually have field work um, which established scholars haven't done for years. Um, but if you are a research student and you only want to kind of submit extensive literature review, you may be disappointed by the reviewers' feed feedback unless your literature review tells a new story about a certain topic or tells us about it from a new angle. I also advise early career researchers to discuss their publishing plans with their institution first, uh, because universities may have different attitudes, you know, to certain journals. Uh, for instance, they might not, if you are a political science department, they might prefer that you publish uh, in, in a political science journal. I know we call for interdisciplinary research, but some institutions really have different plans. Um, and um, and I also heard some institutions are very strict about the remit of their discipline. Um, and they, might, they may be overvaluing metrics like impact factor, uh, which of course you, will, you may feel obliged to apply the same measures if you want to be promoted. Um, I also advise potential authors to make their argument clear and in plain English from the first page and certainly in the abstract as well. The problem is that some authors tend to kind of bury their main argument, which makes it difficult for some reviewers to assess the manuscript, uh, especially if the argument is buried on page 11 in an 18 page article. Um, I have to admit, I did the same mistake many times in the past and I've learned to ask for feedback uh, before I even submit uh, my paper to a relevant journal. This means that academic writing does not have to be kind of a solo task. Um, we should always have at least um, two, if not more academics around us whom we can share our research with and listen to their feedback before we submit to uh, the journal we want to submit to. Uh, I also advise authors when they get their papers published to promote it as much as you can. Uh, our publisher, I think, uh, provides uh, 50 free hard copies uh, to, to the author. So use this to promote your research and send to as many scholars as you can and hopefully they share with others as well. 
Uh, finally, you can contact us to offer your help as a reviewer, so you can see the type of uh, manuscripts we receive. Last but not least, you must have heard about the call to decolonize research, decolonize curriculum, and uh, I believe there are opportunities here from, for scholars from the region, from the Middle East. I advise them strongly to engage in this debate about decolonizing scholarly publishing, uh, but we also need to decolonize the debate about decolonization, meaning that don't wait for uh, European scholars, for instance, to decolonize the research. Start with yourself. Ask yourself why you've chosen this particular theory or this methodology or these studies to review in your literature review section and even the choice of the topic itself. I always advise people, and I do that myself, make use of Arabic language sources, which unfortunate, unfortunately tend to be overlooked or ignored by Western scholars, highlight any misconceptions, misunderstandings, or different perspectives you think are missing in, in Western scholarship, and engage with our journal as a reviewer, if you wish so, or a book reviewer, for instance, um, and also as rev reviewing uh, a reviewer of manuscripts, uh, but you can aim to maybe publish a book review with us, a short review of one title or a long review, uh, reviewing two or three books. So check our website. Uh, I believe the link is provided in the chat. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Noha, for some really valuable advice there. Um, second up, we have Joel Gordon, who is editor of the International Journal of Middle East Studies and a professor of history at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. He is a political and cultural historian of modern Egypt and the Middle East slash Islamic world. He teaches and writes about political change, the intersections of public and popular culture, historical memory, memory and nostalgia, and religious and secular cross currents with emphases on cinema, music, and mass media. He is the author of three books on the era of Gamal Abdel Nasser and numerous articles, books, and film reviews. Uh, Joel, um, please share your views with us. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for inviting me. It's nice to be here. It's morning here in the uh, United States. It's been raining for 12 hours, and uh, but the thunder is gone. So. We won't get washed away, I hope. Um, thank you, Noha, you cut my talk in half. I would basically say uh, ditto. I mean, we're the two journals that basically have the same name. Uh, ours is perhaps a little more egocentric, International Journal of Middle East Studies. Uh, we're sponsored by the Middle East Studies Association, um, which is an international organization um, published by Cambridge University Press. All the links are there. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of us. Um, as well, and we have an international board. Uh, so the big question, I think, to uh, to kind of reemphasize a couple things that Noah said, and I'll I'll just add a few thoughts on that. Is we're talking about publishing in a Middle East Studies journal, so there are two questions: one, should you, and two, what is a Middle East Studies journal? So you know, the big question I always ask my students uh, at the beginning of every semester: where is the Middle East? Um, because it's an abstract. Uh, amorphous area that's ever growing and shrinking. So I've asked them to uh, put our mission statement up and, it, and it's something that I've changed since taking over a couple of years ago. I want as wide a definition of the Middle East as possible. Um, I want, uh, these are aspirational goals uh, to move beyond a more traditional view of the Arab world and its you know, neighbors, what has happened since the fall of the Soviet Union that incorporates uh, Central Asia? How far can we go? Um, not looking to colonize other areas, but uh, looking to explore border zones. Um, and so we're, we're, we're trying to find as, as wide a field as, as possible. This takes us to the question of, I suppose, what is area studies? Something we've all been uh, discussing forever it seems pre-Sayedian and post-Sayedian discussions of area studies. And, uh, you know, having grown up with that, I think that there still is room for 
for something called area studies, as long as we recognize, understand, and critique the shortcomings of what it, uh, what it once was. That takes us into this question of interdisciplinary uh, and disciplinary studies. And, and so, yes, we tend to also be a journal that has published heavily in history um, and perhaps even more so in modern history. And some of that is generated by submissions. Some of that is generated also by the disciplinary constraints that I think Noah is talking about um, in some ways. Um, where should you publish? Uh, listen to the panopticon that's watching you as you approach uh, employment and tenure and promotion. And if you're being told to publish in a disciplinary journal or go to a disciplinary conference rather than a journal like ours or NOHA's in, uh, in particular, listen to them. At the same time, we'd like your stuff, but when you write for us, realize and hope that you're writing for an audience of people who have invested or are investing their interest and in careers in learning about a particular area and, uh, and crossing disciplines. Uh, we're driven by submissions. We're also seeking to widen those submissions. So just to give you a sense of what you may be up against, um, between October 2019 and September 2020, these were numbers that I generated for my annual review, we received 285 submissions. Uh, it comes in about one or two a day. Uh, from 48 countries, uh, 230 submissions from outside the United States, 67 pre-PhD submissions, 218 PhD and above. Uh, and we've primarily published people in the range of postdoctoral and assistant professor, occasionally associate professor, less so full professor. And that, that's a reflection of the greater flexibility that we develop as we move through our careers uh, and the kinds of places that you should be looking to publish. But about half of the submissions that we get don't clear instantly. And our review process is exactly the same as that that, uh, that Noha described. We can talk more about that. Uh, we're looking primarily for peer-reviewed articles, original primary research that causes us to rethink a story or a discipline or an approach that takes us in new directions. We also publish roundtables, review essays, a series that I've initiated on foundational texts where I've asked senior scholars to re-examine a book or a book or a scholar that they read when they were starting out, recognizing that the field has changed dramatically. Uh, and so not simply critiquing that person, but the sort of thinking it through. We've got a second one coming. We published an article by a review essay by William Oxenwald who reread T.E. Lawrence for us. It was a fascinating study. Uh, I point us also or point you also to our sibling journal, the Review of Middle East Studies, which has a slightly different agenda. We don't work together. Um, they're also interested in publishing pieces on pedagogy um, and thought pieces at an earlier stage, perhaps, than we are. And so look at their website as well when you're considering where you might publish. Uh, do's and don'ts real quickly, um, and we can talk more about this. Um, look at our guidelines follow our format. As a reviewer for other journals and IJMES in the past, one of the things that really um, doesn't help when I see a, an article submission is if it doesn't follow the journal's format. Uh, don't assume that uh, a reviewer will like it and then ask you to reformat. We'll send it right back to you and it'll take a lot longer. Um, for those of you who are at the finishing dissertation stage and are looking to use your dissertation as a jumping ground, uh, one of the things that we've noticed from time to time is uh, our people who try to give us an entire synopsis of their dissertation. That's usually a no-no. Uh, find a piece of your dissertation, find a piece of your dissertation that didn't fit in your dissertation, uh, but don't try and cram the whole dissertation in. We, we've sent stuff back and told people, look, we think you're, you're doing too much. Find the one argument that you wanna give us. Situate your work for a wider audience. That's the bit about not being a disciplinary journal. Um, we as readers, and I'm talking about readers ultimately down the road, may not know exactly the disciplinary arguments that you're engaged in, the theoretical argument that you're engaged in. And so on occasion, I've sent a piece back 
to people, but more often than not, it's been rejected in the nervous stage because you're not writing for us. Uh, so write for people who know about the country, the area, the issues that you're writing about, but, but broaden it out for us, even if at times it seems a little bit like you're stating the obvious. Situate your sources. Um, again, because you may have done marvelous work in the Ottoman or Tunisian archives or wherever, but uh, your readers won't really know about this. This could be answered with a footnote, perhaps, but let your readers know what it is that you're doing, not just in terms of your argument, but the type of sources that you're, that you're using. Tell us a new story. Tell us that you're rethinking something. Tell us that you've stumbled upon or uncovered brand new evidence. You know, again, that kind of situation. And always ask that question, should I be publishing in IJMAS or the British Journal or the American Political Science Review or Cultural Anthropology or, or something like that? Uh, and like the British Journal, um, we're not interested in mathematical equations or the kind of language that will chase away 95% of our, of our reviewers. Uh, our review process is pretty much the same. It is, it is rigid. Uh, we do want to provide honest feedback. Uh, I try not to write letters to people that are generic and that say things like we publish a lot and we just can't get to yours. I'll tell you why we don't think your piece is suitable or ready. Uh, we try to be as prompt as possible. We know that people's careers uh, oftentimes are, are hanging in the balance. Uh, we may do multiple rounds of honing. Uh, just like Noha spoke about, as, as needed. Uh, we don't pride ourselves on that. And uh, unlike some journals, we won't publish a little synopsis of how many times your article was reviewed or when you submitted it to us. I don't think that's anyone's, that's anyone's business. There will be times when I've turned to an author based upon reviews that are critical uh, and ask that author if they're being pushed out of their comfort zone because they don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. And that may mean turning to a different kind of journal. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Uh, finally, turnaround time is, is the big question that people ask about. We try to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, we give reviewers time. We try to give them two months plus. Many of them will turn it around quicker. We know that you as authors will be waiting intensely to hear uh, from us. Uh, but we also recognize that at times it's your timing as well. Uh, once we've sent something back to you, it's up to you um, to get back to it, to get back to your research and it's busy schedules with teaching and family and things like that. Uh, COVID has had an impact uh, in a lot of ways on this. Uh, some people it's been it's been a vehicle for being very productive. If you're sitting at home with all of your data, uh, and not much else to do, um, and not having to run into colleagues and, and spend all that time, things have been okay. For other people who've been cut off from research libraries, I mean, my own library shut down over last summer uh, for long periods of time. If you're locked out of your office, if as some authors you've been with parents out of state and taking care of more immediate things, uh, all of that has impacted in many ways. And so we haven't set any deadlines for people. Uh, at that point in time. I mean, I don't want to get into that. And sometimes people come back a year later and we've, uh, and we've gotten onto that. Um, let me stop because I'm sure there'll be a lot of, uh, a lot of questions, but the, the review process as laid out by NOHA, I think is, is something that we, we always want to pay attention to. Okay, thanks. And on to uh, Salim, I guess. Thank you very much, Joel. And now we move on to our final main speaker, um, certainly for anybody like me who uh, works on Palestine, uh, Salim Tamari needs no introduction. However, um, not everybody here works on Palestine. So um, Salim is professor of, or emeritus professor of sociology at Birzeit University, research associate at the Institute for Palestine Studies, editor of Jerusalem Quarterly, which is the capacity in which he joins us today, and a member of the boards of uh, both the English and Arabic language versions of the Journal of Palestine Studies. He's previously been the editor of Heritage and Society, Birzeit Social Science Review, Afak uh, and Afak uh, Filistiniya. He is the author of a number of publications, including Mountain Against the Sea, A Conflicted Modernity, 
the storyteller of Jerusalem, the life and times of Wasif Jauhariya with Issam Nasser, and Year of the Locust, Erasure of the Ottoman Era in Palestine. He was the winner of the 2018 Middle East Monitor Prize for his book, Great War and the Remaking of Palestine, and the 2017 State of Palestine Prize for Lifetime Achievements in the Social Sciences and Humanities. Um, Salim, if you could share your thoughts on how new scholars should be approaching Jerusalem Quarterly in particular and the other journals in which you're involved. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for your kind introduction. I'm very delighted to be with you today. Uh, my journal is called the Jerusalem Quarterly, which uh, I edit with uh, a group of international social science scholars and uh, Pshara Domani from uh, Brown University. Um, I'm very thankful to Noah Meller, actually, who uh, has introduced procedural aspects uh, of publishing, which is very similar to what we have in uh, the Jerusalem Quarterly, with a few important exceptions, which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, we are part of a consortium of journals published by the Institute uh, of Palestine Studies, which include our flagship journal called Majella Abdirassad Filistinia, published in Beirut uh, by IPS in Arabic, and the Journal for Palestine Studies, published in Washington, uh, edited by Shirin Saikali and uh, Rashid, uh, uh, Rashid Khalidi. Uh, the quarterly started publishing in 1998, and we are now on issue number 85. We published four times a year. Uh, we try twice a year to publish thematic issues. So uh, the last, uh, the, uh, from 2020, we published uh, two issues on uh, surveillance, control, and cartography, which is uh, titled Palestine from Above. And that was followed by two issues on uh, home and houses, which is about the significance of habitat and housing in uh, Palestine. And um, the journal tackles not only issues pertaining to Jerusalem as the title, indicates but uh, matters of social science interests for Palestine, Israel, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. So we're more specialized than the other two journals. We're also more specialized in the sense that we are not an academic journal. We are a, a scholarly journal with an academic side to it, but we try to publish uh, articles which are accessible to the general reader and that's one main thing we do with submissions. We try, uh, for example, when people send us bits and pieces from their thesis, we try to encourage them to redo it in a more readable form. And we also um, diverge articles through the editorial boards to two streams. When we get the article, we uh, make a decision whether this is going to be peer reviewed or internally reviewed by the editors. And these are indicated in the each issue so that um, young scholars who need uh, the peer reviewed process for their uh, promotion and tenure and uh, advancing their scholarly career we try to accommodate them by sending it to a, a group of uh, scholars associated with the journal who do the peer review, blind review process. Uh, otherwise, we publish them as essays. We distinguish between essays and articles. Other than that, the process is very similar to the one that uh, Joel Gordon and Noah Miller described for Brismis and for Ishmitz. Uh, we try to focus on issues that are social science and humanities in the first place. We do not publish scientific articles from the natural science or literature, although we do publish issues 
related to literary criticism. The last um, issue has a very interesting revisionist article on the literature of Jabra, Brahim Jabra, for example. Uh, we have advanced thematic issues related to um, uh, articles that have, for example, we did a special issue on the First World War, uh, aerial photography, um, home and houses, which I mentioned, um, surveillance, uh, which makes the journal very relevant to uh, continued academic debates, but we also publish more esoteric uh, themes. We also have a book review section, uh, not very large. We tend to send uh, submissions for book reviews to our sister journal, the Journal of Palestine Studies. Or if you are writing in Arabic, we send it to the Majella Dras Falasini in Beirut. Uh, we, we cooperate a lot between the three journals, but we do try to focus uh, on issues related to the history, contemporary issues, planning of the city of Jerusalem. So in this sense, we are a highly specialized journal, although we do publish, we have been increasingly publishing material on um, uh, Palestine and the Arab-Israeli conflict in general. Um, I think this is uh, basically what I have to say. If I will put the address on the chat if people want to know more about publishing with, uh, I, with the, the Jerusalem Quarterly. Thank you. Thank you, Salim. One thing that I do want to add to all of these, um, all of these talks, uh, to go slightly beyond the journals that we've been talking about and to partly respond to a question that's come in is that in English speaking, in terms of English speaking journals, um, generally speaking, you should not be paying to publish. If you are being asked by a journal to pay for publication, they are probably what is known as a predatory journal, which probably doesn't have good peer review, doesn't have good editorial standards, and is there to make money rather than to engage in scholarly debate. Um, so if you're considering a journal as one to which you might send your work and there are things called article processing fees or any other way in which they're asking for money, this is probably not a legitimate journal. The only circumstances in which they should be asking for money are if you are proposing to use color images because these are really expensive in a print version or if you are printing or if you are publishing with a journal which is normally something that has to be subscribed to and you want to publish open access. But I think this is something that, that's come up at several events where I've been speaking about Contemporary Levant as well. And I think it's really important to get across um, if we're talking to international audiences about the Anglophone journal world is that if you're being asked to pay, walk away because they're probably not a legitimate journal. Right, <laughs> having gotten that off of my chest, um, we're going to start off with some of the questions um, that have been sent in. Uh, these um, at the moment look like they are all ones that could be answered by any of the speakers. So speakers, um, if you think you've got something valuable to say in terms of response to a particular question, um, please unmute yourself and chip in. So first, firstly, we've got a question from uh, Fatma Mahmoud. Is it possible, um, I think, is it possible for a journal to review the article before it is presented to the arbitrators? So I think what we mean here is, would a journal 
give an I give a give a, a a sort of preliminary response on an article before sending it out for peer review. Is there translation into the language of the journal available anywhere? And this is the bit that I wanted to respond to the question of magazine expenses. Are expenses available to all countries? Um, so, uh, Salim, Noha, Joel, um, do any of you want to chip in on these other questions? Uh, can I say something about uh, the translation? I mean, I can speak for our journal. Translation um, is very expensive. So, unfortunately, we don't have, let's say, an Arabic version of the journal, so it is in English. Um, but there was a question about um, if we, well, I said in my presentation that we have stage one, which is that we discuss uh, within the editorial board, we discuss the manuscript before we send it to review. So this is basically what happened. So uh, this is kind of answer to the question about you review it before you send it to reviewers. Yes, we do. And there was another question here about whether we uh, you could check with the editors before submission in case we reject, if we have a backlog, so we reject articles. This is not true. I can speak at least for my journal. We do not reject articles. If they are decent articles, there is no reason to reject it, even if we have a very heavy backlog, because that's not your fault as an author. So we will definitely send it to review. We'll do everything we can, and it will appear online once it's accepted. It just like it might take longer to appear in hard copy, but people will see it online, you will see it online, and there is something called DOI, which you can use if you are going for promotion or you need proof, and of course it will be available online first. Yes, um, we call it first view, and uh, so your article is assigned a DOI number, I'm not sure what DOI stands for, um, but it will go up. Uh, before. There's a whole question that I've raised, uh, at least when I took over with um, the people at Cambridge who are, you know, putting these things out about uh, saving articles that look like they would go together. And uh, they told me that, well, no one reads the journals the same way they used to anymore because everything goes up first view. So once it's up, you know, you can count it as a, uh, as a published article. And I will say that within the Cambridge process, I mean, I, I, the, the question about payment, thank you uh, for answering that. Uh, um, we publish images as well. And on first view online, your images will be in color. They won't be in color in the, uh, in the print journal. Um, and that's a, matter of, uh, that's a matter of cost. But yes, no one asks for, for anything. The question about, Translation is a tricky one. Um, we want things submitted to us in good, clear English as best as possible. Uh, we will on occasion send something back and tell you as an author, look, it looks interesting, uh, but please put it in, I mean, we, we can't do, you know, full copy editing, but the, at various stages along the way, Cambridge University Press, I mean, we do copy edit articles in the end, but if there becomes an issue of translation and you need to work with the translator and your article has been accepted, um, this is something that you may wind up paying for, but uh, CUP can put you in touch with somebody in the house to work something up. Uh, this is the tricky question of, we want stuff from as wide a background as possible, which means that sometimes or often uh, the author won't be writing in English as a first language. Um, so there's a little bit of negotiation in terms of that. In terms of, I get stuff all the time, um, queries from potential authors, does this look like something your journal would publish? Um, I won't read an article before it's formally submitted. Um, I don't think that's fair and I don't have time. Um, but I might send you back a little feedback saying yes or no, it's certainly your topic looks good uh, or no, it looks too technical, um, which is a case that, that happened recently. But uh, that's fair game. But once your article comes in uh, and has been formally 
through the process of being vetted for format, uh, that's when we take a look at it and decide whether or not it goes to uh, peer review or not. And, and for the question about backlog, um, it's not as bad as people may think. Uh, we're swamped oftentimes, but we find the good ones and we'll never send anything back because there's no time for it. Um, it may come out under a future editor, but uh, send it to us, please. Yes, uh, we have uh, uh, submissions which are often made in Arabic. And in our case, uh, we do two things. First, we offer to send the article to our sister publication in Beirut, which publishes in Arabic, or we propose to the author after preliminary checking of the quality of the article to have it uh, translated at their expense. We provide them with names of um, uh, people we rely on and then they deal contractually separately with the translator and then they resubmit it in English. Uh, as far as the uh, initial review process, we, we don't always give a full rejection for rejectionable articles, but we do uh, try to um, convince the author that we have two tracks. The first track is um, uh, subject to internal review by the editors, and the articles can be published as an essay and not as an article. Uh, this is not necessarily turning it to a grade B academic article. It's just two different ways of reading. Uh, many, many times uh, articles are meant to be for more um, a popular audience and they are not academic articles. They are um, articles with a lot of rigorous writing in them, but they're not academic, and therefore they do not go to peer reviewed. We offer the uh, writer that option, uh, and if they insist, then we decide whether it's worthy of being sent uh, for peer reviewed or not. Thank you, Salim. Um, so uh, the second question that we had, were, which was the one regarding whether um, any of the journals desk reject uh, articles due to backlog. Um, as Noha said, that's not normally something that would be done. Most journals will continue to accept articles and find ways to, to publish. And most things are published online, even if it's a while before they make it into a print copy. Um, the broader principle though, um, can you check things with, with editors? Um, uh, certainly with regard to Contemporary Levant and I think a lot of other journals, um, you know, is it okay to email editors to ask a question about the journal, about the subject that you want to write about something like this before you send an article in? Most editors are very open to doing that. Um, you know, we would rather that you sent us an email uh, you know, asked if, if if such and such a topic was was of interest, was was something that would fit in the journal, um, rather than that you took up your time and hours by submitting, going through the whole submission process, and then discovering it's not the right one for us. So, you know, for instance, if you're wondering um, uh, if an article might be too disciplinary, you know, too technical in terms of politics, economics, linguistics, something like this, you know, it, it, it's entirely valid to get in touch with journal editors and just say, you know, should I be sending this to you or should I be considering sending this to um, a, um, a disciplinary journal instead. Um, one thing that um, I think is also worth mentioning is that with the kind of broadening awareness of agendas of decolonization in a lot of subject areas, certainly at least some journals, which have traditionally been, uh, some disciplinary journals, which have traditionally been quite Western focused in terms of their content, um, are now more interested in receiving articles about and from 
places other than Western Europe and North America. Um, so, I mean, one, one journal that I particularly know some of the sort of ins and outs of at the moment is one called Environmental Politics, which is a high impact journal published by Taylor and Francis. They are extremely keen to be receiving um, non-Western focused and authored pieces. Um, and I would encourage people to, to kind of think about that kind of thing. If again, there are issues of uh, tenure or employment that that might be useful for um, for them. Um, Salim, did you have something that you wanted to add there? No, okay. Um, the next question that I'm gonna take, I think because of the types of things that we've already covered um, is one uh, from Annie Evans, how best to get, uh, how best to go about getting involved as a reviewer either as a book reviewer or as a peer reviewer in the different journals. Um, different journals have different um, kind of styles of interaction with, uh, with scholars, especially when it comes to um, reviewing. So yes, if, uh, if you could share with us um, how your journal works in terms of um, taking people on to either peer review or to book review for you. Yeah. Um... So any, you can get in touch with us, contact any of associate editors or editors, our information is on the journal's website. And uh, you can, for instance, email me if you wish um, and tell us your availability also, because um, first tell us your interest topics, like if you are more into the culture or religion or, or political Islam. So tell us exactly what themes you work on and you are interested in reviewing manuscripts about and maybe also your capacity, like how many articles you are capable of reviewing for us per year, uh, so that I don't bombard you with, with articles all the time. If you want to review a book, then get in touch with uh, Dr. Alam Saleh. You will find his email on our website. Um, email him and say, I want to review that book in English or in Arabic, uh, I don't know, um, and see, what he will tell you uh, in terms of further instructions about review. A little bit of the same with slight difference. If you're interested in reviewing articles, uh, send me uh, or the associate editor, Sarwar Alam, a, um, you know, an email with a CV. Uh, we're always looking for more people. We uh, try not to ask the same people uh, over and over and over again, as good as they may be, because it is a burden. Uh, it's a worthy burden um, in, uh, in that regard. We don't generally, I'd say with the rarest of exceptions, um, want reviewers for articles or books who have not yet attained their degree. Um, so we want you to have reached that status. There are other journals that, uh, that will accept you earlier on. Uh, if you're interested in being a book review editor, you can contact us or you can contact uh, uh, and the relevant book review editor for the field uh, that you're in. The one difference I would say from what Noah said is that uh, we generally don't want, don't accept requests from people to review particular books. That's our review editor's job is to find the reviewer um, for that book. And, uh, but if you're in, you know, if you're an Iranian political science expert, uh, you know, send to the political science uh, book review editor, and uh, you'll wind up on uh, you'll wind up on that person's list, no doubt, as they're searching for uh, searching for reviewers. Uh, for book reviews, we solicit our own reviews. We do not receive them from the public. However, if a, a reader is interested, a writer is interested, we would certainly welcome. Uh, uh, proposals for book reviews and we will uh, consider them. And how does Jerusalem Quarterly select its peer reviewers? We have a board, uh, the names are published on the cover of uh, peer reviewers. Uh, we also have a supplementary peer reviewers which uh, are not part of this uh, circular group. Uh, many of them are actually 
uh, former writers who have published in the journal and we rely on them. It's, this is one of the most tough and difficult uh, procedure for the journalists to find because peer reviewers are not recognized, they're not rewarded, uh, and therefore we use our uh, muscles to pressure many of them to, to work with us. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so um, we've had quite a few questions asking um, for the speakers to recommend journals in particular areas. Um, obviously, these we you know we are we know about the journals that we edit. We don't necessarily. Uh, we're not necessarily in a position to uh, recommend journals in particular disciplinary areas, which is what's being asked for. Um, but I'm just going to read off the areas we've been asked about in case Joel, Noha or Salim, you've got any particular um, journals that you've maybe been associated with in other parts of your career that you would uh, recommend. So work on economic development or social protection programs in the region, um, policy oriented journals or journals that might be interested in work on Lebanese heritage art. Yeah, can I, uh, yeah, I saw that. Um, I mean, about Le Lebanese heritage art, to start with that, um, um, I mean, uh, I'm not going to suggest a certain or a specific journal, but, uh, but if someone, I will go back to the piece of advice I gave in my presentation. If someone kind of writes interdisciplinary research that could fit into a culture studies journal or a area studies journal like our journals, you really have to make your decision which journal you would go for, depending on the conversation you will have at your institution, because it depends uh, how you're gonna use this publication for tenure promotion and so on. So um, I would say also uh, the person who asked about policy-oriented journals, uh, I would suggest that you go to the big publishers like uh, Sage, Taylor and Francis, obviously Cambridge University Press, uh, Springer, uh, look at their website under journals and then browse uh, subject areas and you will see a list, a full list of uh, potential journals you can contribute to. So um, if now you, I, I read something about in the region and I'm not, I wasn't sure you mean about the region or Arabic language, for instance, in the region or or, 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 or so on. So if, if, for instance, I think it's a question by Marwa. Yes. Uh, about the economic development in the region. I wasn't sure if you mean in, let's say, the Arab region. And if you are looking for Arabic language journal, um, then I would advise to check uh, big universities' uh, websites there. For instance, uh, Cairo University had links to certain journals, let's say, media studies or, or, or religion uh, or Islamic studies. So um, it depends where your area is. Try to kind of browse their websites, uh, the websites of big universities in the region. Um, this is for non-English language uh, journals, but if you are looking for English language journals, as I said, go for the big publishers, Sage, Taylor & Francis, Cambridge University Press, Springer comes to mind, and Brills, I think. Yeah, and ask your colleagues. I mean, this is a tough one. We do it on an individual basis. I mean, sometimes when I'm writing someone back, um, either at the initial stage or after after peer review, I might make a suggestion. And that's usually based upon the tone of the article. I mean, the, uh, it may be a wonderful piece of local research. There's a lot that's being done, say, in Turkish and Ottoman archives. Um, and the piece may not speak to a wider audience, but may belong in a Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies. And I'll suggest that to the, uh, to the author. Um, at times, if it looks like it can be expanded, we may suggest to the author that they revamp it and try sending it back with a, uh, with a wider audience approach. And so the Lebanese art question is, is, is one of that too. We've had stuff from uh, archeologists and uh, people working in, uh, 
in art history and sometimes social planning. And sometimes it just looks like they're speaking to their colleagues. And that's when we say, you know, speak to your colleagues. Um, if it's encyclopedic in some cases, if it's, uh, if it's too rooted in a particular place. Uh, so we try to deal with those on a, on a case by case basis. Uh, for policy and things like that too, I should say that generally we're interested in you know, the policy of countries or movements, let's say, you know, again, in a region that we can define. So we don't really accept or are interested in pieces on US policy, for example, in the Middle East or the peace process or, um, or, or things like that. Uh, there are journals that do that. Uh, sometimes your piece may belong in a journal of imperial history if it's based largely on colonial or imperial archives. And I will try and steer you that way, um, whatever the quality of, of, of the piece, it just doesn't fit in our case. I, I want to emphasize something that Noah said earlier on is that, you know, we do put an emphasis on regional languages. Uh, Persian, Turkish, Hebrew, uh, and you know we've gotten a lot of stuff uh, dealing with policy that's based upon U.S. wire services. And I know that in some countries, it's a really big deal when the internet opens up and you can get access to the Washington Post or CNN. But in our world, these are not really primary sources of interest to us, and so. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with Chinese policy in Iraq, we want Chinese sources as best possible. If you're dealing with uh, Israeli Gulf relations, you know, there's got to be Arabic and Hebrew in, um, in that, even if some of those government sources are, are published in English as well. So we, we try to deal with this on a case, on a case by case basis and, you know, where we're going to push you to, uh, to think. Thank you. Um, I want to suggest uh, an area which many people have neglected, namely the university journals, um, which in our area, living in a global world where the incentive to publish in the West is encouraged by local universities, uh, have been running against another current, which is to look for uh, local universities in the Middle East who have been publishing high quality journals, but have been losing their um, uh, prospective writers because uh, uh, the, uh, what, for example, uh, committees for tenure promotion do not actually consider their own journals for that purpose. And this is a big tragedy, which we have been trying to fight here and with, we have some success in local Palestinian universities, especially with at Najah, Birzeit and Bethlehem University who publish their own social science and humanities journal. And I think this, and they accept submissions in English as well as in Arabic, in the case of Bethlehem also in French. And I think this is a arena which Maybe interesting for some of your viewers to pay attention to. Thank you very much for that, Salim. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting um, area for people to be thinking about, um, especially if perhaps uh, we've got young scholars um, either in the region or also ones who might be interested in building careers um, in the Middle East instead of necessarily uh, staying in the West. I think it's also a question that is um, quite important in terms of thinking about the coloniality and decoloniality of um, academic publishing as a kind of wider issue. Um, so very much worth something, something worth bearing in mind. Um, and I would say from my own experience on that, that it can be a really, really fulfilling process. Um, I recently had an article in an Armenian um, journal uh, uh, of the department of, I think they call it Oriental Studies still um, at Yerevan University. And um, 
publishing in 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 regional journals can also be really interesting as an, a, an emerging scholar because you can potentially end up having conversations with people whose sort of academic culture is very different from the one that you might experience in your own country just in terms of the kind of questions and priorities and things that people are talking about in their in their day-to-day -day scholarship um, so it's something that may not be super fantastic if what you're most interested in is a, a kind of CV tenure kind of publications but if you've got wider interests then it's it's something I would very much encourage people to bear in mind um, okay um, I think we'll take one more question and I'm going to take um, so we've got a couple of quite basic uh, kind of yes no ones that I'm just going to give a very brief mention to one is about publishing if you only have a master's degree now you probably aren't going to be asked for a CV when you send in an article. You don't have to have a certain set of qualifications often for most journals, but you need to present a sufficient level of debate and awareness of sources and awareness of what's going on. So there might be people who are practitioners who have master's degrees and not PhDs who might be able to produce fantastic work and that's great um, generally speaking certainly my experience is that um, work that comes from master's students is not yet developed enough theoretically at least um, even if the um, field work is very good um, again unless people have a lot of say professional experience as well as an educational experience in terms of francophone students Going back to the question of translation, um, how is it possible to publish in any of these four journals? Um, I think that's kind of been covered in, in terms of some of the other questions about translation um, and the fact that most journals don't have the resources to be able to translate. Um, they may be able to put you in touch with translators that they would recommend, um, but, but basically these are journals that publish in the languages that they state and I'm afraid that your responsibility, if you want to submit to them, is that you find a way of creating a sufficiently good quality English manuscript. Um, and, you know, there are creative ways that you can maybe think about doing that, particularly if you're a student, in terms of things like offering language swaps um, and things like this with other students. So the final question is this, this one of um, the other way around. So this is from Jens Handeler, and he asks, um, that along with two colleagues, he's working on establishing an independent multilingual Palestinian arts and culture journal slash magazine. Are there resources available that would be helpful for us as faculty interested in the editorial side of things? So Naha, Joel and Salim, if you have brief answers to give to that question. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't know resources here refer to what, it, hopefully not funding, because I have no idea, but uh, if you mean like how to uh, publish uh, or propose a new journal title, then certainly the publishers I have listed, which is Sage, Taylor Francis, um, uh, Brill, uh, Intellect as well, you can approach both publishers with a proposal uh, or letter of interest saying, I want to propose this new journal about Palestinian arts and culture and we are a group of this is our team and this is our uh, uh, interest area and your plan basically and how it is different from other uh, available uh, journals. Um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that some publishers actually will be very interested. Maybe something that you want to think about a university press for. I don't know. Uh... I mean, it's just as something that, uh, you know, we don't know a lot about, I think any of us from the, from our own particular journals, well, Cambridge University in a sense, but, you know, I, those kinds of uh, smaller university based press might be interested in something like that, because they're working on a smaller economy of scale. They're under pressure from their institutions, oftentimes to produce profits. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know how this happens, but uh, new journals that pop up with Indiana University Press or 
for others. Um, it, it might be something that you want to look at. And I don't know about European universities. Salim, have you got anything uh, you would suggest? Uh, that, uh, this is a very tough market to produce a new journal. You have to convince both the funders and the outlet, uh, logistic outlet uh, group that this journal is marketable. Uh, in terms of funding here, uh, since this is a Palestinian journal, we have two groups that may be able to uh, help you with funding. One is the Qatan Foundation, and the other is the Ta'awun, which is based in, in Jordan. Uh, both do uh, support cultural activities of this kind. For the board, I think what you should do is something which I shouldn't say, but I would say it anyway, which you should scavenge from existing boards of uh, sister uh, journals. And, uh, f but the proposal that you look at an international group that's willing to market is probably the best way, but you have to sell the journals to them. Uh, both, we did, we did subcontracting with uh, Rutledge uh, Brill is another, I think, was mentioned. Uh, they do uh, sponsor new journals, but you have to convince them effectively that this is a marketable uh, journal. Thank you for that, Salim. Um, okay, so we are one minute off. Thank you very, very much to our speakers. Thank you very, very much to our audience and those of you who have um, asked questions. I just want to highlight that um, Contemporary Levant has an annual article prize. Um, submissions have just opened for this and will run um, for about the next two months. So if you have articles that you've been thinking about submitting, um, then that is uh, a possibility that we'd of course love you to consider. Um, the link for that is uh, on the CBRL website. Um, and I think absolutely perfect timing in order for us to close down uh, in time for people in uh, Palestine and Jordan to head off for Iftar. Um, so uh, yes, thank you very much um, all of you for coming and thank you to those at CBRL behind the scenes for organising this. Thank you to you Sarah as well as the distinguished professors here for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. And I'd also like to mention uh, my colleague, the director in Jerusalem, Dr. Taufik Haddad, who was very much um, involved in setting up this session. So thank you all very much indeed. And thank you, Sarah, Taufik, and Max, Joel, <laughs> Noha, and Salim. Uh, thank you. It's been a thank very, you. very useful thank you. session. Thank you. Good to see everybody. See you soon, hopefully. <laughs>